morning and turn to Exodus chapter 20 and as you are turning there just a reminder that tonight there is no choir at five o'clock and there is no evening service tonight and uh, so enjoy your time with your family enjoy the I'm sure some of you are going to probably be grilling and so forth so enjoy that time together this evening as you're turning to Exodus chapter 20 last week's message challenged two groups of people as we honored our mothers and so forth, the message challenged parents. We looked at Proverbs 1.8, which states, Hear, my son, your father's instructions. Forsake not your mother's teaching. And the challenge of this verse is not only to our sons to hear what is being instructed, but also to our fathers and mothers to instruct and teach our children so that the children can hear and keep what is being instructed and taught to them. It's a great responsibility that we have as parents to make sure that if our children are to learn that we are teaching them and secondly the message challenged children to honor their parents as we may recall the word honor means to give weight to esteem to regard to consider their parents words in the many matters of life and I trust that uh, all of us took this challenge to heart and uh, I have to say as we go forward, if you see that I'm squinting, it's because my glasses were shattered. And uh, they were progressive. So I, I do have an extra pair. If I put the, like, this, like, six foot out, I think I'd be good with them. But, uh, so you just have to bear with me a little bit this morning as we uh, go forward. But Exodus chapter 20 and verse 13, it says, Do not murder. It's the sixth commandment in our study of the Ten Commandments. So as we consider this next text of scripture, God gives us clear instruction to his children concerning the preservation of life. And we're told in the Hebrew language that this commandment is simply translated two words, don't kill. Amazingly enough, the sixth commandment is just about the only commandment that is widely accepted and followed completely amongst God's children especially. Not so much along the world around us, but especially amongst God's children. If you think about it, is our culture really willing to have no other gods besides God? Christians included. Is America really willing to have no idols in their life? The second commandment. How often in the course of a day do we hear God's name used in vain? Third commandment. Are we willing to observe a day of rest and worship on the Sabbath? Generally speaking, do children honor and obey their parents, even amongst Christians in Christian homes? Or consider the seventh commandment, no adultery, yet we hear of immorality and marital affairs all the time. Stealing? It's not so bad, especially if the one being stolen from is wealthy or won't even miss it. After all, lying doesn't hurt anyone, does it? And really, who doesn't want the things that they see other people have? But murder, by and large, we agree and practice that command. Although there are times when we want to do it. But after my study this week, I learned that there are at least seven different words used in the Hebrew language used for killing. The word chosen for this text of scripture is very precise. It is not the word used in reference to the legal system or a word that's used to refer to military death. Often you hear them say, well, if God is anti-death, if God is anti-killing, why does the military do it? This is not that word. Several different words, seven different words in the Hebrew language, but this is not one of them. It is not the word used to describe an execution. That's a different word. Uh, it's not the Hebrew, it is not the Hebrew word used to describe people who are killed in mortal combat and battle. That's even yet another word. It is not the word used to describe the killing of an animal while hunting. There are specific use, uh, words used for each of these circumstances. The word carefully chosen in the sixth commandment is the word ratzak, which literally means unlawful killing of a human being. It has the idea of the deliberate taking of one's life in a premeditated fashion, such as personal enemy, a cold-blooded killing, the intentional taking or killing of another person's life, or manslaughter. 
it is very precise used in this text. Unfortunately, the word ratzak can also refer to wrongful death circumstances as well. And this is why Moses made the concessions for accidental death. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 42, let me just quickly read that. Deuteronomy 4 and verse 42. There was a concession made for accidental death. In verse 42 it says, Someone could flee there who committed manslaughter, killing his neighbor accidentally without previously hating him. He could flee to one of these cities and stay alive. So there was a concession because even though it is the same word, it is an accident that happened without premeditation, without, without anger in his heart. So in summary, the commandment refers to the unlawful taking of innocent life. So are there circumstances where killing is warranted? I mean, after all, if he says, do not kill, are there circumstances where killing is, un is warranted? And the answer is yes. It seems to go against the grain of so many. And in fact, there are times when, when there is a national uh, situation on the news where there are people picketing, you know, thou shalt not kill. Once again, different word used for different scenarios in the Hebrew language. But first, in an unfortunate circumstances where your life or the lives of your family are under violent attack, you have the right to protect yourself in self-defense. In our text there in Exodus chapter 20, or in the book there, if you go over just a couple of chapters to Exodus chapter 22 and verse 2, we see the example of this. Verse 2 says, If a thief is caught in the act of breaking in and is beaten to death, no one guilty is guilty of bloodshed. So the bottom line is, there was an ability to protect yourself and trust you and me. If someone breaks into my home and I feel like our lives are in jeopardy, I'm going to protect my family, as should you. The bottom line is, there is leeway for that, although it should be last result. Secondly, killing is warranted in the carrying out of a death sentence. Remember, that is a different word. When justice is served by the court of law, there's a key phrase there, and a death sentence is warranted, killing is acceptable. But only in those circumstances. And we're going to see from Scripture where that comes from. It wasn't just a good idea that someone brought out before, before time that capital punishment is just this wicked, evil thing. It was warranted in Scripture years earlier. And then thirdly, killing is permissible in capital punishment cases when carried out by court officials and governing authorities. Let's look at a couple texts of Scripture to, to clarify this. In Leviticus chapter 24, we see an example of this. Leviticus chapter 24 and verse 17. says, If a man kills anyone, he must be put to death. Now think about this. I wonder how many times across the country, when people who are proven guilty through DNA, through eyewitness accounts, through circumstantial, that is beyond a shadow of doubt. What if they were to be put to death rather than put into prison for years and years and years and years? Depending on the state, I did a study of this a few years ago. Um, every state has a minimum requirement of what it costs to keep that prisoner alive for a period of time. On average... It varies from between forty-eight and sixty-eight thousand dollars a year to keep one inmate who has been proven guilty alive year after year after year. So, Pastor, I don't agree with that. Well, I didn't make up the law; God did. Bottom line is, He says, if a man is guilty of killing someone, he must be put to death, and it would save our taxpayers millions upon millions upon millions of dollars every year. But that's not uh, what our society often wants to do. Go back to Genesis chapter 9. We see once again another example of where capital punishment originated. And think about this. This is way back in the book of Genesis. Chapter 9, verse 6. It says, Whoever sheds man's blood, his blood will be shed by man, for God made man in his image. What's he saying here? Very clearly, that if a man takes another man's life, and it's proven that he took another man's life, then his life ought to be taken. That is scriptural. 
It's not hateful. It's not vengeance. The vengeance is God's. God made man, and only God has the right to take man's life. So he says, if someone takes man's life, of man his life shall be taken. Then in Romans chapter 13 and verse 4, another interesting verse says this. Kind of puts it in perspective. It says, for government is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, because it does not carry the sword for no reason. It's an interesting thought to me. Consider that there are so many people, when the police come by, they immediately freeze. They become, become fearful. Um, okay, in, in, in instances of speeding, I'm one of those. I, I have a heavy foot once in a while. I, I'm not going to lie. Um, but you know, it's amazing how many people, as soon as they see any type of authority, they immediately freak out. But it says there in Romans 13, therefore are what? Good. And don't be afraid if you don't do anything wrong. If you're not guilty of anything, there's no need to run. No reason to be afraid. But it says if you're wrong, if you're guilty, then you should be afraid. Because it doesn't carry a sword for no reason. There has to be justice. And oftentimes, civil authority is God's way of keeping peace. If you break the law, there should be fear. If you don't break the law, you have nothing to fear. So God allows the taking of life in very specific circumstances. But the idea at the center of the sixth commandment is the unlawful taking of innocent life. It's not the idea of, you know, hey, me just going out and getting vengeance and say, well, this guy deserves to die, so I'm going to take care of it. That's sin. That's wrongfulness. But when government... As when our governing authority says this has happened, there is proof that it's happened, there is no denying it, there is no way around it, then God's word is, needs to be implemented. So God is all about the preservation of human life. God, not man, since God is the giver of life, he alone has the right to take it. He has set the parameters for it. There are other forms of murder taking place in our world today as well. The Sixth Commandment carries the thought of unlawfully taking of innocent life. But consider these possible circumstances where innocent life is unlawfully taken. The innocent bystander uh, from a drive-by shooting. The drunk driver on the roadway. The innocent baby killed in abortion. The very act of abortion is to abort life. And Psalm 139 is very clear about these thoughts. Uh, if you would, just listen as I read Psalm 139, just a couple of verses, not the whole passage. But in Psalm 139, I want to read verse 13. Verse 13 says this, For it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. So when does life take place? At conception. Verse 15, it says, My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in secret. When I was formed in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw me when I was formless. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. God creates life, and he alone has the ability to take it. Uh, in, in this book I was reading this week, I found an interesting uh, excerpt I wanted to share with you this morning. Um, just about a page and a half, if so if you'll bear with me. I thought this was interesting insight here. The Sixth Commandment has important implications for contemporary society. We like to think of America as a civilized country, but we are living in angry, violent times when murder in all forms is, is very common. Um, I can remember just a couple years ago, uh, actually several years ago when I was waking up in Indianapolis, our first couple years, we never heard of murder. But five years after we lived there, it seemed like the first thing on the news every morning was so-and-so was shot on such and such street. How many of you wake up to the morning news now and you turn it on? So-and-so was shot in such and such street. It's almost every day. We are living in angry times where people want to take vengeance upon themselves and create their own form of justice. I think he was dead on. They're very common. There is such a callous disregard for human life that many people say we 
uh, are now living in what Pope John Paul II rightly called a culture of death. There is death in the city. In places like Philadelphia, there is a shooting almost every day of the year. Hundreds of people die. There is death in schools. There has been a rash of shootings from Kentucky to Columbine. And teachers have to watch out for the students who carry weapons. Little League parents want to kill the ump. Sometimes they do. There is death on the highway where motorists get into rage or drive under the influence of alcohol. There is even violence at home where parents violate their sacred trust by striking in anger. Where does all this violence come from? From evil hearts that have turned away from God. But the rapid spread of brutality in America has been accelerated by violence in the media, where an entire industry promotes the breaking of the Sixth Commandment. According to the American Psychological Association, by the time the average child finishes elementary school, he or she will have watched nearly 8,000 televised murders and 100,000 acts of on-screen violence. And things are getting worse. The New York Times comments, if you have the impression that movies today are bloodier and more brutal than ever in the past, and that their body counts are skyrocketing, you're absolutely right. Inflation that has hit the action-adventure movie with a big slimy splat. He goes on, one more, one more excerpt here. What is disturbing about all this is that it affects the way people live. Um, the College of Forensic Psychiatry conducted a comprehensive review of scientific studies on the relationship between violence and on-screen violence in real life. Out of a thousand studies, more than 980 established a definite link between violence on the screen and violence in real life. According to the best estimates, media violence has doubled America's homicide rate. David Grossman is not surprised. A retired military psychologist, Lieutenant Colonel Grossman, is an expert in teaching people to overcome their natural reluctance to kill. He was shocked to realize that children who watch TV and play violent video games are subjected to the same methods, the conditioning and desensitization that the Army uses to train soldiers. We are teaching our children how to kill, and we should not be surprised when they do. But he says, not all forms of murder are violent. Sometimes death carries a clipboard and wears a lab coat. In a recent book called Culture of Death, Wesley J. Smith argues that a small but influential group of philosophers and healthcare policymakers actively seek to persuade our culture that killing is beneficent. Suicide is rational, and natural death is undignified. And caring properly and compassionately for people who are elderly, prematurely born, disabled, despairing, or dying is a burden that wastes emotional and financial resources. This kind of thinking is a direct assault on the biblical view of personhood. Often the assault is intentional. In the words of this medical professor, and listen to this, and this will stop. We can no longer base our ethics on the idea that human beings are a special form of creation made in the image of God. Singled out from all other animals and alone possessing an immortal soul. He says, you can't, that's nonsense. Once this religious mumbo-jumbo has been stripped away, we may continue to see normal members of our species as possessing greater capacities of rationality, self-consciousness, communication, etc., than members of other species. But we will not regard as sacrosanct the life of each and every member of our species. These are our policymakers within the medical field. Sometimes death wears a lab coat, he says. If life is not sacred, what is? I wonder if we people in, of God in America truly care about preserving life. I wonder, what would we do? Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 23. I'm sorry, Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. This to me is an amazing passage, a familiar passage. Luke chapter 10, beginning with verse 29. 
It says, but wanting to justify himself, justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus took up the question and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, beat him up, and fled, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan on his journey came up to him, and when he saw the man, he had compassion. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and when I come back I will reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell on the hands of the robbers? The one who showed mercy to him, he said. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do the same. It's amazing how often in our culture we say we're all about the sanctity of life. We're all about pr preservation of human, human life. But do we even take the time to help people in need? I would submit that we don't. We are so busy in our culture. Anybody not have anything to do in a given day? I mean, just sitting around twiddling your thumbs wondering what to do next? That's not our culture. We are so busy, so, so in, in tune with getting the next thing on our project list done that we don't take the time to help people in need. You say, well, I'm not a murderer. That may be, very well be true, but are you helping preserve life? Because the essence behind the Sixth Commandment is the preservation of life. It's not just about not killing unlawfully. It's also about preserving life, too. What are we doing to preserve life? What are we doing to help people who are struggling? What are we doing to help people who have legitimate needs? I think that's something we really need to think about as a church. And I'm not talking about we as Harvest Bible Fellowship developing a special fund to help people. We, we have that. And we do from time to time. I'm talking about the church being the church. You are the church. The church goes to work. The church goes to the grocery store. The church goes to school. The church talks to the neighbor next door. We are the church, and we need to be the church and help those who are struggling. I wonder if we do that to the expectation of our Heavenly Father. You look at the text there just for a moment. A priest? You'd expect somebody who is, quote-unquote, religious to help, right? I mean, isn't that the expectation? Religious people are supposed to do that. I mean, that's what God made them to do. You're a pastor. It's expected of you. You're a deacon. It's expected of you. You're a Sunday school teacher. That's what you do. No. Here's the example of someone who is a priest who is expected, but yet on the same line, he just goes around the other side and like, oh, I don't want to deal with that today. I ain't got time for that. Then a Levite. Once again, religious, but just wasn't concerned. And then you got a third person who is not expected, who does it. I wonder if we would be so willing to take time out of our schedules to help preserve life. What about there are other forms? I wonder about the murder of the heart. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. 5, verse 21 and 22. And that's not the passage. Either that I can't read my notes. Let's go to 1 John 3. I'm sorry, 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 15. It says, Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. What about the murder of the heart? Is there somebody that you wish were dead? 
Somebody you just can't stand and you have contempt for. It's no different. We need to follow Christ's example. Isaiah 53, who gave himself up to help others. He even offered forgiveness to those who murdered him. Remember as he went to the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Who's the them? Everybody that was there. The Roman soldiers, the politicians, the people who hated Jesus Christ. You see, if we were truly a picture of Christ, we would want to preserve life and not wish for death. This is what puzzles me about forgiveness. Bear with me just for a second as I go off the path, just for a moment. Forgiveness. Oftentimes we say, I forgive you. But then we harbor it in our minds over and over and over again. And when someone gets upset, they harbor that hurt, that resentment. And hurt and resentment undealt with turns to bitterness, and bitterness will destroy. I have to wonder sometimes, do we really truly practice biblical forgiveness, or does it, is it what leads to all the other anger and separation that causes people to want to take justice in their own hands? I'm amazed at how many times over the years I've seen somebody get upset with the church. And the phrase is often, the church did this to me, and fill in the this, whatever it may be. It wasn't the church. It was a particular individual in the church that did it, or a couple individuals. But the church did this, and I'm going to leave. I'm going to go elsewhere. But I, you know, I'm over it now. I forgave them. Really? Because if you forgave, why did you still leave? I don't understand. Forgiveness to me is, is, if it's biblical, it, it forgives. I'm not saying it always forgets. But there needs to be times when, when forgiveness is practiced, the resentment goes away. The anger goes away. Because that's what Christ did for us. And true forgiveness does forget a lot doesn't harbor the sinfulness. It doesn't say, well, okay, I forgive you, but... No. It forgives. But there are a couple lessons we need to be reminded of from this text. Murder is the unlawful taking of innocent life. It's not what we read about in battle. It's not about, it's not about the uh, um, person who just says, I'm going to do what I want. That's that's the person who says, I'm going to do it however I want, regardless of what law says. We need to be remember that, I'm sorry, we need to remember that every human being is created in the image of God. And we need to do all that we can do to preserve human life. What are we doing to preserve life? I'm sure most of us in this room, I don't know your past. I don't know if you're an ex-convict, I have no idea. But I'm going to make an assumption that we have no murderers in here. I'm just going to assume that this morning. Because by and large, we practice that commandment as believers. But do we do the flip side of that? Do all that we can to preserve life. Help those who are in need. Help improve life. I think that's something we need to work on as a church. As a body of individuals. As a body of believers. To help. And I just know in my own life, I don't know about your life. But I'm busy, like most of you. And I also know this, that to help people, it takes time. It just takes time. Sometimes you ain't got time for it, but you take the time. There's no excuse for it as believers. We're here to preserve life, not take from it, not make it worse. So not just unlawfully not taking a life, but doing all that we can to preserve life because God is for the preservation of life. 
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to just study for a few moments the Sixth Commandment and see a perspective that maybe we hadn't thought about. To see that there are circumstances where taking of life is permissible. It's not always desirable. It's not easy. But in circumstances like capital punishment where someone has blatantly, openly, vengefully killed someone and there is no shred of doubt, you said it's right in those circumstances to take their life. The governing authorities to do that. But Lord, there are times in our own lives that we don't do much to preserve it. Lord, I pray you'd help us as a body of believers, help us as individuals to get beyond ourselves to the point where we are willing to help others. It's hard work. It's time-consuming. But you are for the preservation of life. And I pray, God, that we'd be faithful doing that. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed, just ask for a moment that no one be looking around. But as we do each week, just give you an opportunity to respond to what you've heard.